to fly your car from the moon to the earth. Um, if a vehicle had a one-to-one -one mass ratio, meaning that the fuel tank holds as much as the payload, uh, it could thrust at 1G continuously for 245 days. This is the kind of figure people are talking about for interstellar travel by conventional means through normal space. Uh, whatever we might think about interstellar travel, this obviously gives us ample power for maneuvering and travel within the solar system. Um, so, in terms of empirical consequences, detecting neutrinos is extremely difficult, but there have been neutrino detectors in operation. Some of them are actually being called neutrino telescopes these days because they detect astronomical events. Uh, co uh, literally for decades, uh, they had already established a solar neutrino problem uh, in the late 1970s. Now, most of the output of a neutrino drive will be muon neutrinos because those are uh, produced by the first step in the decay cascade and we recall that you want to keep the decay cascade short because that's what's what makes the drive more efficient. Uh, however, the solution to the solar neutrino problem that I mentioned a moment ago is that neutrinos oscillate. They change identity. Muon neutrinos will, over a sufficiently long flight path, some fraction of them will transform into electron neutrinos, which can be picked up by the detectors. So this postulates the possibility of a very simple retrospective test for whether vehicles that we see do, or that we think we see doing violent maneuvers in Earth's atmosphere are being powered by neutrino drives. Simply plot the direction of the maneuvers in three-dimensional space, note, note what direction they're accelerating in, plot the opposite direction, ignoring trivial obstacles like a few thousand miles of rock, and see if they intersect a neutrino telescope. If they do, uh, consult their records and find out if they got a blip of neutrino events at the appropriate time. I have no idea how such a test would come out, but at least it's a test that's doable. Uh, there are also some more practical consequences. Um, antimatter is a tremendously rich energy storage system. There is a lot of storage stored energy in such a drive, E equals mc squared. A vehicle that crashes or even just loses whatever its containment system is, uh, is going to explode with um, a great deal of power, even uh, a kilogram of so or, or so of antimatter is going to be a multi-megaton blast. Uh, among other things, this means that shooting them down doesn't sound like a very good idea if they're using this drive. Um, offhand, the only way I can think of to avoid a tremendous explosion on, upon crash landing is if the vehicle has already run out of fuel. Uh, which, when you think about it, is a pretty good reason for a crash landing to happen. Um, just as a uh, note for possible implications, there's still speculation about what the Tunguska explosion in 1908 was, uh, but the estimated power of the blast cor would correspond to the amount of antimatter that would power a small vehicle for a few hours of high-G maneuvering. Uh, so if a, one, one can only imagine what a large vehicle powered for more than a few hours of maneuvers would, would, would produce if something bad happened. Um, so that brings me to the end of my talk and I'm happy to answer questions. A uh, couple of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, so just a detail first. You talked about efficiency improvement from the 30% to more by pre-accelerating the matter-antimatter mix. But from conservation of momentum, it would seem that whatever you gain from the increase uh, by pre-accelerating, you've lost by doing the pre-accelerating. Uh, let, me, let me just ask 
add, add something to this, and then mm -hmm. I'll, I'll get off the microphone. Uh, second thing uh, related is uh, that if we are to believe the UFO sightings, these spaceships can uh, make right angle turns and so on. So any sort of immense acceleration from any sort of uh, inertial uh, accelerator would slam the poor uh, uh, inhabitants of the, uh, of the spaceship against the wall at, at, with tremendous uh, uh, velocity. Therefore, it seems like some sort of drive would have to turn off inertia rather than use it. And then finally, given what you've talked about with this uh, very efficient drive, how about looking for a new green technology? Okay, to address uh, those points one after another, what happens with the pre-acceleration is that because the neutrinos escape, the portion of the imparted momentum that corresponds to their share of the total mass energy just leaves the system. That's how you get thrust. In terms of protection against high G maneuvers, uh, okay, geometrically there's no such thing as a right angle turn. It may require enormous acceleration, but there is going to be some acceleration involved. Uh, I, uh, writing about ways to uh, protect against high accelerations is another issue, but um, in principle, uh, we, th we think we can already imagine ways to shield human astronauts from accelerations up to 100 G or so. We, don't, we, we are missing some of the chemical and biochemical technology for that, but it's, it seems to be a solvable problem and I, I did not want to uh, try to branch into too many areas of technology. In terms of a green technology, antimatter has the drawback that it is a secondary uh, fuel source. It is a storage system rather than a power generation system. Okay, uh, Bernie, and then we'll go to that side of the room. I'm a little surprised to hear you say that the most efficient uh, um, uh, form of propulsion is by having very high exhaust velocity but the ratio of the momentum to the energy goes as the inverse of the velocity, which is the opposite of what you, what you want. Uh, the most efficient, okay, here I am turn, casting efficiency in terms of how much delta V can you get for a certain mass of fuel. The higher, uh, the higher your exhaust velocity, the less mass you use up, but the more energy you expend, and this is simply a fact of life about the way reaction drives work. And the second question was back to what uh, Garrett alluded to, that the reason you're getting the neutrinos to go out in one direction, the direction that you want, is because you're pre-accelerating the, the antimatter. Mm -hmm. And so, so you just transferred the acceleration process to the antimatter acceleration. So there you have the same problem, the same problem of, of, tr of not being able to get around uh, Newton's third law. Uh, the, the whole point here is to work with Newton's third law. Um, if you had a fuel lump and you simply shook it back and forth, accelerated it, and then caught it and stopped it, uh, you would get nowhere. Because you can use this annihilation transformation to convert part of it into a form that simply escapes out the back, the amount of thrust you produce in the acceleration phase is not completely neutralized by the catching process where you intercept the portion of the, inter of the energy that still interacts with normal matter. Then you're using that energy to accelerate the next lump in the train. In a realistic system, this would be a continuous process, but thinking of it as a sequence uh, make, makes the concepts a bit easier to follow. Okay, uh, if Stoyan Zarg is in the room, can you start coming up? Okay, and uh, Dale Graff. Uh, yes, sir. A question. I think this summer we'll learn a little bit more about what went on at Tunguska when the Italian team digs down into that lake to find out whether or not it was uh, from a, a comet that hit or not. So I look forward to seeing that result. Um, I have a comment on the, uh, on the propulsion thing here. Neutrinos are really tough to detect, and the detectors I'm aware of that are deep in mountains only catch a few hits a year. So maybe there's going to be a change in the technology that might help increase that hit rate. And you might want to comment on that. And the third comment I like to make is cosmologists do a lot of talk about 80 or so, 90% of the universe, I think it's 96% of the universe being dark matter. 
is there any theoretical work done in how we 